Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the element barium. I have a sample of barium in a glass vial right here. Now, normally barium is a shiny, silvery element, but as you can see, this looks kind of blackish, and that's probably because this was exposed to the atmosphere and has formed a dark oxide layer on the surface. So let's get back to our presentation. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements. I encourage you to pick that one up. Check out his fantastic website, periodictable.com. Barium is the 56th element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 56 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. In 1774, Carl Scheele suspected that the mineral barite contained a new element. He was only able to isolate barium oxide. Johann Gottlieb Gahn was a Swedish chemist and metallurgist who discovered manganese, Two years after Scheele isolated barium oxide, Gahn also isolated the same compound. Close, but no cigar. Over 30 years later, in 1808, Sir Humphrey Davy was able to isolate metallic barium by the electrolysis of barium salts. Davy also used this method to isolate many other elements— potassium, sodium, calcium, strontium, magnesium, and boron, as well as chlorine and iodine. The main source of barium is the mineral barite, also spelled with an I. Uh, barite is chemically barium sulfate. Another source of barium, though less important than barite, is witherite, which is barium carbonate. Barium can also occur in romanochite, a composite mineral which is also a source of manganese. The barium mineral benetoite, barium titanium silicate, occurs as a very rare blue gemstone, and this is the official state gem of California. When exposed to ultraviolet light, it fluoresces a beautiful blue. Sir Humphrey Davy gave us the name for this element, from the Greek baris, meaning heavy, because barium is a heavy element, we get our modern name, barium. The custom was to add IUM for metallic elements. A side note here, in 1812, Edward Daniel Clark claimed he discovered barium and proposed the name plutonium. This was rejected by other chemists, but did become the name for the radioactive element, element 94. Since most of the world's barium is consumed as barite, production numbers are usually about that mineral, not the element. China is the major world producer of barite, followed by India, Morocco, Mexico, and others. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, China produces almost 50% of the barite in the world, followed by India with 20%, Morocco with 14%, Mexico with 12%, and everyone else with the remaining 7%. Barite production has risen almost exponentially from 1920, doubling in production almost every 30 years. Moving along to the metallic element rather than its minerals, barium is a member of the alkaline earth metals group of the periodic table. These metals are somewhat reactive, but not as much as their cousins in the column to the left, the alkali metals. As with most elements, the price of barium varies widely with purity and the quantity you buy. 99% pure barium goes for about $3,500 per kilogram, more expensive than many of the other elements we've seen in this series. The element barium is fairly uncommon in the universe, coming in as the 36th most abundant element in the universe by mass, about a millionth of a percent. Also at 36th, barium is about the same abundance in the sun. It's the 31st most abundant element in meteorites, at about 2.7 parts per million. 
Surprisingly common in the crust of the Earth, it's the 17th most common element at 340 parts per million. Barium is the 21st most abundant element in the oceans, and while not common, it's the 24th most common element in us, about 300 parts per billion. If you could reduce the people in the United States to elements, there would be about 10 people made of barium. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Barium is here. I understand this looks complicated, but let's look at just barium a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang until now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of barium created by various processes. The vast majority of barium present today is believed to be produced by dying low mass stars. That's the magenta area. A tiny amount is produced in supernovae, the yellow area, and a very small proportion that's almost invisible, that green sliver on the top, is produced in neutron star mergers. Note, the barium produced by dying low mass stars, the magenta area, doesn't get started until a little bit later in the history of the universe. That's because low mass stars exhaust their nuclear fuel much more slowly and last a long time before they start dying. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. In this case, 56 protons for barium. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are 40 isotopes of barium, and of these, there are seven stable non-radioactive isotopes. These seven stable isotopes are found in different proportions in nature, from about one-tenth of a percent to almost 72 percent. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos meaning same or equal, and topos meaning place, since all these various forms of barium occupy the same place in the periodic table. Of the radioactive isotopes of barium, these are the longest lived, the ones with half-lives over one hour. We'll talk about what a half-life is in a couple slides. Now remember I said barium has seven stable isotopes? Well, that may have been a bit of an exaggeration. Actually, one of those seven isotopes is very, very slightly radioactive, with a tremendously long half-life. Barium-130 has a half-life 116 billion times the age of the universe, so essentially stable. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any of the isotopes from the previous slide. You'll see why I chose 1,024 atoms. Hint, it's a power of 2, and we'll be doing a lot of divisions by 2. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1,024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half as many again, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Barium has a moderately low density at 3.51 grams per cubic centimeter. As a reminder, 
water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter, and I've put up more densities for you here. As you can see, barium is denser than aluminum, but only about half as dense as iron. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself, but we'll have to wait to do this until we're back face to face. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, and magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, barium's density is 3.51 grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle, so fairly low compared to the other elements, between aluminum and titanium. Barium has a fairly low melting point at 727 degrees Celsius, or about 1340 degrees Fahrenheit. It boils at 1,870 degrees Celsius, that's 3,398 degrees Fahrenheit, 1,443 degrees C above its melting point. If we compare the size of the barium atom to that of hydrogen, we'd see something like this. The barium atom is almost five times the size of hydrogen. Those outer electrons are held fairly loosely. A picometer is a trillionth of a meter, by the way. Atoms are small. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Barium has the third largest size atom of the elements, so it's way up there in size. Barium is a soft element, coming in at only 1.25 on Mohs scale of hardness. You could easily scratch barium with your fingernail. Here's a chart of the element hardness from hardest, boron on the left, to the softest, cesium on the right. Barium is the 10th softest element, not much harder than the softest element, cesium. Barium has the 18th highest rate of thermal expansion, about 20 parts per million per degree Celsius. This means that if you had a one meter long bar of barium and you heated it by one degree Celsius, it would get longer by 20 millionths of a meter, or about one hair width. But remember, you only heated it up by one degree. If you heated it by only 10 degrees, it would get longer by 10 hair widths. You could feel that. Here's the periodic table of the spectra. Barium has a good number of emission lines all the way across the spectrum. If you put a barium salt into a flame, it will glow with a yellow-green color, representing all the lines in its spectrum combined. Taking advantage of this, Pyrotechnicians use salts of barium to color fireworks green, though boron has much the same effect. Different elemental salts provide different color effects, as you can see here. This is a sample of ceramic glazed with barium carbonate, among other ingredients. It produces a range of beautiful blues and purples. This Chinese mural dates between 25 and 220 CE and shows musicians playing their instruments. The blue background and other purple colors, called Han Blue and Han Purple, are based on barium copper silicate. So barium has been in use for 2,000 years as a colorant. Vacuum tubes, ask your grandfather, were the active components of most electronics before the 1960s. These were the transistors of their age. The earliest room-sized computers were built from these. This is ENIAC, or Electrical Numerical Integrator and Computer. It was the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer built in 1945. It eventually had 18,000 tubes. You can see a few of them up here. By the way, 
A modern iPhone has four processors that each run over 640,000 times faster than ENIAC, but I digress. When these tubes are plugged in and powered up, a hot glowing filament in the center of the tube provides the electrons that move from the cathode to the anode of the tube. Here's a simpler diagram showing the internals. To get the electrons to boil off the hot cathode, a phenomenon called thermionic emission, the cathode is coated with a substance that can easily give off electrons when heated. This substance is often a form of barium oxide. Sticking with tubes for a minute, remember when televisions look like this? In the old style tube televisions, an electron beam was focused and deflected by coils, striking the phosphor coated screen. Here's a cross section of the picture tube. Those electrons were created with a hot barium oxide coated cathode at the end of the tube's neck. The fast moving electrons striking the face of the tube could produce X-rays. To keep the X-rays from exposing TV viewers, the thick glass face of the tube contained barium carbonate, which absorbed the X-rays. Barium is a good absorber of X-rays, as we'll see again in a few slides. Inside the glass envelope, there must be a very good vacuum for the tube to operate. That's why it's called a vacuum tube. Once the air is pumped out and the tube is sealed, the remaining oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water is pushed to the glass wall and chemically absorbed by evaporating a reactive, low boiling point metal. This part of the tube is called a getter. You can see the ring-shaped getter at the top of the tube on the left. Barium was one of the metals evaporated by the getter. To heat up the getter and vaporize the metal, as I said, often barium or cesium, the tube is placed inside of an induction coil like you see here. The induction coil's large AC current causes another high current to flow in the getter ring, heating it up. The vaporized metal reacts with the remaining gases in the tube, creating a better vacuum. YBCO was the first high temperature superconductor that could be cooled with only liquid nitrogen rather than the more expensive and colder liquid helium. It turns into a superconductor at a temperature of minus 180.2 degrees Celsius. YBCO is shorthand for the chemical formula for yttrium barium copper oxide with the letters Y, B, C, and O taken from that chemical formula. Superconductors conduct electricity without resistance. Here, a magnet placed on top of the cooled superconductor generates an opposing magnetic field in the superconductor below that rejects the field of the magnet, leaving it floating above. This is called flux pinning. Speaking of magnets, many of your refrigerator magnets, the ones that have a dark gray or black appearance, are made from a combination of magnetite, the black sand you pick up at the beach, and barium carbonate. The combination can be strongly and permanently magnetized. The material is, however, a ceramic, and hence is brittle and prone to chipping and breakage. Their advantage is they're cheap to make in mass quantities. You'll also see these in speakers. They provide the magnetic field to push the speaker cone in and out, making the sound that you hear. Remember the mineral barite? The one we saw a few minutes ago that's mined for its barium content? Well, that mineral, barium sulfate, has low toxicity and is moderately opaque to x-rays. It's useful for imaging the gastrointestinal tract. If you want to image the upper gastrointestinal tract, your esophagus, stomach, or upper intestine, you drink a dose of barium sulfate from the bottle on the left and then get an x-ray. Here, you see the swallowing process as the barium goes down. If you want to image the large intestine, the bottle on the right is used, but you don't drink this. It has to go in the other end as a barium enema probably less pleasant than drinking even the awful chalky barium cocktail. I'll spare you the live action enema, but 
Here's what one of those x-rays looks like. You can see the dark shadow of the large intestine cast by the absorbing barium sulfate. You see the spine in the background. Almost 80% of the barium mined in the world is used in oil drilling. Barium sulfate mud, made from barite, is used as an additive to oil well drilling fluid. When the well is filled with this dense mixture, it creates a high pressure at the bottom of the well. This keeps the drill hole from collapsing in on itself and prevents the high pressure petroleum products from rushing up the well to the surface. Kind of a, an oil well enema. In spite of all those old movies you've seen, the last thing a drill crew wants to see is a gusher. They're actually more appropriately called blowouts. Not only does this waste precious petroleum product, it's very hard to stop and creates an environmental catastrophe. Remember the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico? This gusher polluted most of the Gulf. In addition to the obvious environmental damages, these blowouts can throw thousands of feet of drill pipe all over the place, creating a dangerous, uncontrolled, and expensive accident. The drill fluid with barium sulfate prevents this from happening by filling the drill hole with a heavy, high-density mud. The same barium sulfate chemical was in the news lately. You may have seen a story about the whitest white paint. Here, Zhulun Ruan, a Purdue University professor of mechanical engineering, holds up his lab's sample of the whitest paint on record. One of the main ingredients in this record-setting paint is our old friend, barite, or barium sulfate. Zhu Lin's lab has carefully controlled the size of barite particles and selected an appropriate binder to hold the particles together. This paint reflects 98.1% of incident sunlight. Normal white paint reflects only 80 to 90% of the sunlight. This has some interesting consequences. This new paint formulation reflects most of the incoming sunlight, but it also allows through infrared radiation from the painted surface beneath the paint. With the combined super high reflectivity and infrared transparency, the painted surface can actually cool to a temperature less than the ambient temperature surrounding it. Let me restate that. The paint absorbs so little incoming radiation that the surface actually gets cooler than its environment. The paint could help buildings use 15% less air conditioning. On the left, you see a visible light photo of the painted sample. On the right, you see a false color infrared image. Yellow is hotter and dark blue and black is cooler. Notice the whitest white square is the coolest thing in the infrared image. This is something not even commercial heat rejecting paints can do. The whiteness of barite or barium sulfate has been used as a paper brightener here in photographic paper. Notice how the mineral name sneaks into the marketing. Your body does not use barium, but probably still contains a few micrograms absorbed from the environment. As usual, we'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about barium. Let those enduring your enemas remember fireworks green splendor. In the next program in this series, we'll begin to examine a whole new row of elements called the rare earths. And we'll start with the first element in that row, lanthanum. We hope you'll join us. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about barium.